Hello and welcome. You've joined us at a really exciting time in the journey of our parish. Today is our Pledge Sunday where we've been on a journey with God and we've been seeking his heart for what we should give financially for our project in the centre of St Austell where we're converting an old pub into Trinity Centre where we will make connections, where we will make friends, where we'll have a warm welcome and we'll see people coming to meet Jesus through us and through their experiences alongside us. So you're really welcome. I pray that you'll stay with us and continue this journey as we go into what God has for us. Can we pray as we prepare to worship now? Father, we thank you for your amazing goodness that you travel with us. You never ask us to go where you haven't gone first before. And so now we pray that whatever is on our heart or mind, whatever worries or anxieties we may be carrying, uh, whatever things we, we haven't yet got right or sorted, we thank you that you meet us and you meet us in worship where we sing and pray, where we just bring our hearts honestly to you. And so we do that now. We choose to do that in the company of this church family, although virtual we are joined by your spirit. So we just say, come Holy Spirit and inhabit this time because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the privileges of being uh, in leadership in the church is that we see things very much on the inside. We see what God is doing in so many amazing ways because of our, our role and um, I thought to, to bring our Pledge Sunday into focus, I'd ask the staff team, uh, many of whom you will know, some are new, uh, what they see God doing uh, just at the moment in this journey. And uh, right now, this is what they had to share. It's a lovely place to be in the church office when we have an exciting project like the Trinity Centre going on. And I've found it deeply moving. Um, people just post envelopes through the letterbox and they walk in and push something under the counter and say, this is for Trinity Centre. And wow, it's just brilliant. It is brilliant. People are saying, right, if God's behind us doing this as a church, I'm in. So a great thank you to all of you. Hello. So what do I see God doing at the moment? Well, I think the word that comes to mind is connection. I think we have all felt very disconnected and isolated in some cases over the last six months. And for me, starting my new role, I came from a place where, because I knew everyone and I knew what I was doing, I felt completely connected in. And then I started my new role and ah it was a sense of disconnection again only for a short time but it was new and everything had changed what I expected it to be was suddenly very different and I couldn't connect with people in the same way or in the way that I had hoped to but actually God has been teaching me to slow down to listen to reflect and to think creatively and uh I am enjoying connecting in so many different ways, uh, whether that's with the, the youngest of our children, to our home groups and our youth and within our team. God is about connection, connecting us and building those relationships in spite of everything else that's going on around us. And that has been such a blessing to me. As I look around, I can see that God is at work in us, in our staff team, in the way that he's called us all to be part of that team. We come from lots of different backgrounds. We cover a wide age range. We have differing um, gifts and abilities that, that God has given us to use in his service. And, and he's called us all together for one purpose, which is to search for his heart and to share what we find. We face many challenges and um, uh, with the Trinity Centre, um, the funding for all of that, 
all of the uh, restrictions that uh, we're under at the moment with COVID. But God is at work in us because he's beginning to give us um, a picture, a vision of how the how we might be in the future. We're looking beyond COVID. We're looking to um, share God's heart in our community and in the deanery. And it's not just about us sharing what we have found. It's about encouraging other people in the community who have no connection with God at the moment to search themselves because he is a God who wants to be found and then to encourage them to share with their friends. And so the kingdom grows in that way. And I find that really exciting place to be in. During creation, God chose to have seasons. And as God's people, we too have different stages in our life, not chosen by us, but ordained by God. And it's our duty to seek God and recognize what he is calling us to. The season is changing and you can hear the wind blowing outside, but that is nothing compared to the wind God will send. We must be looking out, not to see more of the natural, but for him to move in ways that we may not expect. And perhaps we've never seen them before, but we must watch and pray. Don't those observations uh, just cause your heart to sing? God is an amazing God and uh, it's such a privilege to see him at work. Uh, I'm inside today, as you can see, because uh, it's raining outside and uh, I didn't want to get my hair wet. I love to be outside, but uh, I'm inside for now. And uh, as we move to a time of sung worship, I just uh, want us to pray that uh, the realisation that God rains down his love, uh, the latter rains, as the Bible calls it, into our hearts and families. And even when things don't seem to be hanging together quite right and they're not the way we'd like them to be, uh, God is in control. Know that God is in control and nothing happens by chance. So let's worship God now in song.
there is a fountain of love poured out over us. We've just sung. Shall we just remain in that place whereby we, we are open to the fountain of God's love still pouring on us even as we change our focus together. Father, we do thank you that you pour out love. It's, it's, a, it's a shower, it's a stream, it's a flood, it's a river, a river of life, giving energy and spirit and life and hope to our souls. And we desire to experience more of that in a more deep way, not only this morning, but in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Henri Nguyen, a, a theologian, wrote this about prayer. Prayer is no easy matter. It demands a relationship in which you allow God to enter into the very centre of your person, to speak there, to touch the sensitive core of your being and to allow God to see so much that you would rather leave in darkness. I, uh, over the four years at Ken, I've been here, I've grown to love this church. I love the people here. I love what I see God doing. I love uh, to see uh, what we've heard from the staff team, which uh, is replicated in so many ways. And yet, and there is a, an and yet, I also have a sense in my heart that uh, we've missed some of the point in, in latter years of what God is really about for us. And so on this really important day of, of Pledge Sunday, uh, I don't want us to give just as an automatic response to the fact that the leaders are saying, let's do this. I really sense that God wants us to come in confession for the people that we haven't been, for the church that we haven't been. And as I say, I love this church and I think there is so much that we can celebrate. I think we have a beautiful heart. I think we have a warm welcome, true, genuine welcome, which is so often missing in, in church circles. I think we have a desire to be uh, evangelists in the town. We long to see the poor and the downtrodden and the weak and the sick uh, set right. But I don't think we've always obeyed God. And so at this time, this really important day, which is full of joy and hope, I think we also should come to God in confession. Uh, you may have been here a hundred years. I know some of you have. You may have been here just a day. This may be you looking into our church fellowship. But I, I'd like to lead us in a confession which is from the heart and hopefully moves us to a place where we can say okay we've allowed God into the places in our heart which I'd like to keep in darkness and this is our corporate confession so can I encourage you to to stand or to kneel or to lie on the floor and be truthful with God about how our church has been and that's leaders people servants, people who are no longer with us, people who are still with us. Lord Jesus, we confess our pride because of our size and our history and our importance in the town. We acknowledge every trace of superiority, judgment and self-elevation in our fellowship. And we are truly sorry. We confess our lukewarmness to the town, to the poor, to the lonely and the rejected. Please forgive us. We admit 
that we have erected fences and barriers. When we have avoided pain and getting our hands dirty by serving. Lord, we are so sorry. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge our idols and those things we worship ahead of you. Position, possessions, our work, our money, our family, our influence and our power. Lord Jesus, you emptied yourself and we choose to do the same today, to empty ourself of self and to be clothed with you, Christ. Jesus, today we decide to come home. Make us who we are meant to be. Heal our wounds, wash our sins in your blood, and so restore us where we are out of shape and off track today. And Lord, help us to begin again with you and we ask to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And we receive him now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we receive the fount of love that is poured out upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Hosea has been guiding us on our journey. And now we're going to hear the final chapter, Hosea 14. The reading this morning is taken from Hosea chapter 14 and verses 1 to 9. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount all horses. We will never again say, our gods, to what our own hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I'm like a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hosea has followed the travails of the people of Israel and described the disasters that fall upon them. They've lost their way. And here in the final chapter, uh, the history behind it is that in 772, the Assyrians invaded Israel, the capital city fell, and all that had been predicted through Hosea and the other prophets happened. Uh, for all their intentions, the people of Israel had strayed from God and the nation fell. They had no cause for argument. There was, there was, no, um, there was no way out. It was their own doing that produced this outcome. But the amazing thing here in chapter 14 is Hosea, and maybe throughout everything he'd seen it, he sees beyond the disaster, the catastrophe, 
And this is so important for us in this current context of COVID. He sees beyond the catastrophe of the present and what he sees is a new hope. He sees a new marriage, as we explored earlier, and he sees a new chapter between Israel and his uh, and, and the beloved, between God, God and his people. He sees a new possibility. And I'm sure you see the, the beautiful resonance of Jesus here, that um, if we make this an individual, an individual's life has gone haywire. Uh, they've strayed. They've broken the rules. They've had other gods. They had other idols. It's all come crashing, crashing down with some sort of disaster. And yet God isn't finished and he hasn't given up. And Jesus is the offer of a new chapter, a new start, a new marriage, a new covenant. And so the people of Israel, of course, personify me as an individual human being, somebody who's gone off the tracks and yet God has not given up on me. And so the wonderful thing about chapter 14 is that repentance brings blessing to the people of Israel. And Hosea says, if you will just return to the Lord, verse 1 says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Notice the possessive sense. He's your God. Come back. And if you will, your sins have been your downfall, but take words with you and return to the Lord. In other words, it's your fault where you find yourself, but it's God's feeling and action that can bring you home. He, and say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously and we may offer the fruit of our lips. We'll come back. Ask for forgiveness and it will be given. And in verse four, God responds. It's, it's almost this conversation between Hosea and the people of God and God himself. And he says, verse four, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. It's a beautiful thing that God offers each one of us, free acceptance and love. And I'm sure that for many of us, this echoes the story in Luke 15 of the lost son. You know the story. The son goes off and leaves his father, finds himself in the lowest position possible with the pigs. And he comes to his senses and says, I will return to my father. I'll go back from whence I came and I'll see if he will forgive me. I, I don't hold out too much hope, but maybe I could just be a hired hand. Maybe I could just work my way from the lowest place back into some sort of relationship with my father. And of course, the most moving scene is the father is already at the gate. The father is already searching the horizon. And when he sees his son arrive in rags, smelling of manure and pigs, he throws his arms around him and, is and he's restored to the position of sonship. Because that's what this is. This is about Israel becoming sons and daughters once again, as they were always meant to be. And Jesus calls us through this minor prophet to become sons and daughters. He calls us and says, yes, you've gone off track, but I have paid the price. And as that song said, there's a fountain of love being poured over you. And it's a case of will you dwell in that or will you go off? and find other ways of trying to fill that hole in your heart. You know, my mum was made an orphan at eight. Her mother and her father died in the same year and she found herself as an eight-year-old orphaned. And she was taken in by, uh, by other parts of the family, of cous by cousins. But you know, um, I now see so clearly how it, for so much of her life, my mum was searching for assurance and affirmation. She loved her mother. We have lovely photos of my mum with her mum, my grandmother. Uh, and um, she obviously adored her father, who was a Scot uh, and a shopkeeper. And she was so lost for so much of her life in the sense of she didn't know who she was. She wasn't sure about her value. She wasn't sure about what mattered 
about her life. She didn't have the anchor points of hearing a father say, I love you, through her formative years, of a mother saying, we love you, through her pubescent years and growing up and being given away in marriage. And I see my mum's behaviour and her character so formed by her being made an orphan. And yet she became a Christian in later life and so much of that neediness and need for affirmation uh, was resolved and found in Jesus because she now knew she was a daughter of God through Jesus pouring the fountain of his love upon her. And you know, there's so many of us that are orphaned, not just by uh, life, by parents, by our blood, flesh, but we're orphaned in our spirit. We don't know who we are. We've left home and we are without the Father's voice. And something in the confession that I, that I prayed earlier was, was about Holy Trinity and Paul Pian and Pentu and leaving who we're meant to be. And I firmly believe that Trinity will be us coming home to finding who we're really meant to be. You know that Isaiah 61, to bind up the brokenhearted, to feed the poor, to be the loving arms of people in their need because they don't have fathers and mothers who've brought them up to know Jesus. They don't have mothers and fathers present in their existence. And Trinity offers us, I believe, the opportunity to provide a place where spiritual orphans and physical orphans can come home and be welcomed. And that's where our beautiful welcome and our lovely warm embraces can happen through the coffee shop, through the rooms that we can use for courses on parenting and marriage and divorce recovery, through CAP and helping people with their debts, through running courses like Alpha and Emmaus, where people, Emmaus, interesting, you know, on a journey, where people on a journey can find that they need to come home to the Father who loves them. I believe that what Trinity can personify is Jesus calling us home. And it will be a different call for every person, but it's the same heart behind the call. How can they return home? If they won't come to church on a Sunday, might they come to the cafe on a Monday? Might they come to a course on a Tuesday or perhaps a toddler group on a Wednesday? Maybe they'd come to a, a different sort of counselling group on a Thursday. Maybe they'd bring a friend on a Friday. Maybe they bring their family on a Saturday. And then maybe just one day on a Sunday, they might walk into worship and realise that these people are sons and daughters of the King. And they're welcome. And everything they do is about calling and bringing people home. What I love about this parish, uh, this, this parish and this passage is the fragrance of what happens next. Because God says, I will be like the Jew to Israel. Imagine us being the Jew to St. Austell. And then he says, um, they will blossom like a lily. The cedar of Lebanon will send down its roots and its young shoots will grow. And then it says, men will dwell again in the shade and they'll flourish like the grain. And then he speaks about blossom and the cedar and the vine. And it's all about fruitfulness. And I passionately believe that as men and women and children come home to Jesus through Trinity, we will see blossoming lives. We will see fruitful lives, not wasted lives on the end uh, of an injection or drugs. We will see lives rooted in the love and fountain that is Jesus. I think we're called to be those people that are waiting at the gate, waiting for those returning and then running to them, forgetting our pride and position and our money will enable that to happen. If we can just release it to God like seed on the ground, it will be amazing to see what he does with it. I am like a green pine tree and your fruitfulness 
comes from me. Praise God for the call that he's given us. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray it may speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen.
I love that song in its uh, wholeheartedness to say, if creation will worship you, then so will I. It's a, it's a prayer of commitment. And in our time of prayer together now, uh, as we come towards a close, and as during this day, we will be pledging to God uh, our financial giving, it felt right to Kay and I to, to pray for us. And uh, I would like to pray uh, a father's blessing and Kay will pray a mother's blessing. So that any of you that are watching and listening in uh, sense that that orphan spirit, that sense of not really knowing who you are, or if your parents were absent, or if they were abandoning of you, or they just didn't, they just weren't present and didn't parent you, then uh, what we'd love to do as we close this chapter on Hosea, and God says, come back, uh, we want to offer a virtual hug to you. These are words written uh, by Russ Parker, and it's uh, such uh, wonderful prayers of uh, bringing back those that have felt or experienced that orphaning spirit of just not being parented. And it's hard to come back to Father God when perhaps your father wasn't there uh, or your mother was absent. And so I'm going to pray uh, a father's blessing, and I want to encourage uh, anyone who feels this is for them to hear and receive it. And likewise, Kay, in a moment, will pray a mother's blessing as we draw to a conclusion. So can I ask you to pray? I'm going to say a few words of introduction and then I'm going to pray the prayer and I invite you to just receive them. Uh, and then Kay will pray hers too. So shall we pray together? Some words of explanation. A father's role is to protect, to provide, to bless and to establish his child's identity. Maybe your father did that for you. Maybe he didn't. Perhaps he abandoned or abused you sexually or physically, verbally or emotionally. Maybe he died before you were ready or left you when you were still very young for some other reason. Maybe he made you his pet delighting in you so much that you haven't been able to break away and become your own person. Perhaps he was distant and removed and cold and showed no interest in you. Perhaps he terrified you with his anger and his rage. Perhaps he made you a scapegoat for all that went wrong, for all the troubles that he had. And maybe you suffered at his hands. Perhaps he blamed you for things that were not your fault. Maybe he worked too much or too hard and never spent any time with you. So he didn't join in with your games, your dance recitals, your birthdays and your achievements. Maybe he spent too much time with you, forcing you to be with him, to become an athlete or a student or a doctor, a lawyer, that person you never wanted to be. Perhaps he left you in the care of hurtful, harmful, dangerous people. Maybe he didn't see or believe when you told him that you needed help. Perhaps he was just too preoccupied with himself to notice you. I hope you're willing to hear these words, words of a broken father speaking to you. And I want to ask you to close your eyes just for a moment. And I realize I'm not your father, but I'm going to step in to his place and I would allow, ask you to allow yourself to hear these words. I ask your heavenly father to richly bless you in all the places that I failed you. I ask the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of his cross to, and blood to set you free now from any harsh or cruel words that I said especially the ones you keep remembering over and over again. I am truly sorry. I ask the Lord to set you free from heart injuries that you sustained from me or from others in whose care I placed you. I ask the Holy Spirit to set you free from heartache, disappointments, dreads, grief or rage that you cannot resolve. I'm so sorry for all and any other struggles that I may have caused you. May you be healed from being ignored by me 
or overindulged by me. If I ever made you feel less than or not good enough, I am deeply sorry and I ask you to please forgive me. May the Lord set you free from working so hard to please me when nothing ever could. May the Lord set you free from trying to get from me what I never had to give you. I am so sorry. And may the Lord set you free from blaming me for failing you, not because I need that, but so you can be free to grow, receive and achieve. May you be creative in ways you have not yet imagined. May the Lord give you all the things I was unable or unwilling to give you. May the Lord guide you in ways I could never grant and may he give you peace. May the Lord free you from the effects of my addictions, my anxieties and my anger. May the Lord free you from feeling that you have always to be perfect or that you have to be what I expected you to be. I pray that God will help you to see that the hurt and pain that I caused you came from my own childhood and hurts. It limited me and I am so sorry that it has limited you. I pray that God will remove from you any belief that you were not wanted or loved. I pray that the Lord will release you from any unhealthy bond that you may have with me. And I want you to keep all the good that came from me and give what you do not need to carry to God now. And so now may the Lord embrace you with his Father's love and may you know his healing in Jesus' name. Amen. A mother's assignment is to nurture, love, tend, treasure and teach her children. Maybe your mother was wonderful. Maybe she wasn't. Perhaps she abandoned you or abused you, sexually, physically, verbally or emotionally. Maybe she died before you were ready or left you for some other reason. Maybe she made you her idol, delighting in you so much that you haven't been able to break away to be your own person. Perhaps she made you the scapegoat for all her troubles, so that you suffered for things other people did to her that frightened, hurt or angered her. Maybe she came between you and your father, or continually forced you to choose sides. Maybe she placed you between herself and her husband. Maybe she didn't protect you from him. Perhaps she blamed you for things that were not your fault at all. Maybe she insisted that you mother her instead of her mothering you. Maybe you felt important about that, but didn't realise you were becoming trapped and overwhelmed by the responsibility it brought. Perhaps she left you in the care of hurtful, dangerous people. Maybe she didn't see or believe you when you went to her for help. Perhaps she was just too busy to see anything you wanted or needed then. If you are willing to hear the words of a wounded mother speaking to you, please close your eyes for a few minutes. I realise I'm not your mother, but please allow me to stand in for her and in the place of your mother who may or may not have said any of these things. Please allow yourself to hear these words. I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to set you free now from any harsh or cruel words that I said, especially the ones you keep remembering over and over. I am so sorry. The Lord set you free from heart injuries you sustained from me or from others in whose care I placed you. The Holy Spirit set you free from heartache, disappointments, dreads, grief or rage you cannot resolve. May you be healed from being ignored or smothered by me. If I ever made you feel less than or not good enough, I am deeply sorry and ask you to please forgive me. May the Lord set you free from working so hard to please me when nothing ever would. May the Lord set you free from trying to get from me what I never had to give to you. I am so sorry. May the Lord set you free from blaming me for failing you. Not because I need that, 
but so you can be free to grow, receive and achieve and be creative in ways you have not yet imagined. May the Lord give you all the things I was unable or unwilling to give you. May the Lord guide you in ways I never could and grant you peace. May the Lord free you from any of my grief, fear, terror, anger, dread and expectations you are still trying to live up to. May the Lord free you from feeling that you have always to be perfect. I pray that God will help you to see that the hurt and pain I caused you came from my own childhood. It limited me and I am so sorry if it has limited you. I pray that God will remove from you any belief that you were not wanted or loved. Please forgive me for not nurturing you. I pray that the Lord will release you from any unhealthy bond that you may have with me. I want you to keep all of the good that came from me and give the rest to God. My daughter, my son, I love you. I am so proud of you. I am so glad you were born and that you are here among us. Be released now to be the person that God created you to be. Be free, my love, and live. God, your loving father and mother, cause your life to flourish and be fulfilled in his healing grace. Well, one of the sad things about COVID is that in church uh, and indeed in outside of our bubbles, we can't touch uh, or hug one another. But these prayers that Kay and I have prayed over our church family today usually end with the offer of an embrace, a hug, uh, to seal that new commitment and freedom that we feel. We are going to open our church between 9 and 12 uh, today on Pledge Sunday and there will be an opportunity for these prayers to be, pr to be prayed in person if you would benefit, if you would like that. Unfortunately, we can't hug and we're really sorry and sad about that. But I'm going to pray now as we end together that God would just, you'd know God's embrace uh, at this time. So may we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing in our fellowship. And on this Pledge Sunday, we pray that you would take what we offer and you would multiply it and bless it. And so now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and may his loving embrace encircle and enfold you. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, your heavenly Father, be with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it's great to be with you and we'll see you soon. Go well. <laughs>